In the last video I made about making these chairs, I said I'd talk about these chairs more soon, but then I decided to make a set of plans for sale for those chairs, and that took a few days, and then the kids got sick, and now it's a week later, and I'm finally filming this video. My dad came up with uh, this sort of uh, style of dining chairs somewhere around 1986, and after that, all the dining chairs he made are based on this proximate design. This one with armrests and a tall back, this one without. The last chairs he made were in 2008, and at that point he was already mentally declined a little bit, but I was home during part of the process, so I took some photos of that. But the chairs weren't of such great quality, so they're all still up in the shop attic back home. I studied absolutely every angle of this chair when I came up with a CAD model for it and I've really gotten to appreciate the uh, beauty of this design or at least I think it's beautiful and it's also a very simple design because there's not a single miter in this chair all the mortise and tenon joints are square the back is a bit of an angle but that's not actually a miter joint it's just that this piece is cut at an angle whereas most dining chairs will have the seat that's sort of a trapezoid and oftentimes the back rungs are actually also angled in the opposite direction which makes for a pretty complicated joinery and personally I find the uh, square seat is much more attractive than something like this and with the seat that's wide on the back I often end up sitting in a chair like this or like this and just shifting around when uh, sitting at the table talking a lot whereas a chair like this with a narrow back just doesn't give you very many options that way. And the way my dad cut the uh, back rungs out of uh, thick solid pieces of wood, he didn't have to do any bending and that also made the chairs easier to make in a uh, slightly larger volume. These ones too are cut from uh, solid wood and uh, he got really good at carving out that sort of shape uh, just with a spoke shave. And I actually tried copying this chair, although I didn't actually have one of these ones with me when I copied that, just one of these, so I made that sort of rung and I also carved these with a spoke shave and the shape on these ones is not as elegant as uh, what my dad had done and I think it would take a, a few more iterations to get that right but with these ones I just decided to uh, bend the wood because I didn't have anything thick enough and I'm very happy with how these came out but then I also made uh, this one and because this is just uh, cheap 2x4 material, I did have some stuff that was thick enough and I just bandsawed these out of a 2x4 and that was really quick to make. So if you want to build chairs like this, I recommend uh, if you have wood that's thick enough, just bandsaw it out of that, providing your bandsaw is good enough. Or if you want to challenge, uh, try steam bending it. If you do, not steam bending, bending in a, in a kitchen stove. If you do and you screw up, you're not going to waste a whole lot of wood because this is only 8 millimeters thick. And I quite like how these came out. And of all the chairs that my dad ever built, he always said, if it breaks, bring it back and I'll fix it. And only one ever failed and that was in our house because it was kept in a wet basement. And the top expanded a bit. And my dad left some room for expansion here. But it expanded so much that uh, these little uh, things ran out of range and the top got wider and it pushed so hard it pushed against here and everything being very damp the glue softened so this joint got pushed apart and that's the only time one of these chairs ever failed and generally chairs if they fail they'll fail right here because when you sit on a chair and lean against the back this is the joint that gets stressed the most and a key to making that sort of joint strong is to make it a relatively thin tenon that goes deep into the wood and that way if the tenon goes in deep enough the only way that it'll break is if the tenon itself breaks off and it takes a lot to actually rip the wood apart and I've seen some chair kits on YouTube recently where the uh, mortise and tenon joints look something like this the tenon isn't even the full width of this piece on the end and it's thick and short and the thickness doesn't really help any it's not like this tenon is going to rip off but making it short means it doesn't go very far into, say, the leg part. And that means it just doesn't hold very long. And making this part thicker means more of the leg gets cut away, which of course means that is going to pull apart. So when that gets stressed, probably this thin little part here will just break off 
right along here is where the tenon goes only that deep. And some of that is often because the uh, back legs on a chair, again with the trapezoidal seats, and then the legs might be angled this way while the uh, rail is angled this way, which means that this part joins at quite an angle to the leg, and then when you put the uh, tenon on the end of the leg at an angle, that inherently weakens it and it's very difficult to make a long tenon. And so you end up with these stubby little angled tenons that often have a corner missing just the way it was cut out of a piece of wood, as you can see in my friend Elaine's video that he posted a few days ago. So imagine a chair with a trapezoidal seat and the back legs kind of angled outwards. So if you make a long thin tenon that goes into the back part like that, well the wood grain goes straight along here and that tenon would probably split just right along here. So it being long doesn't help any because it's going to fail because the wood grain doesn't run along the tenon. So ideally you would have a straight tenon with an angled face like this, but uh, that is just about impossible to make with uh, at least a machine of moderate complexity. So you would pretty much want to hand cut these things and then when that joins into the wood here, you're also getting very close to the other face here, so it gets very difficult to make that sort of thing, so nobody does that. So the most sensible thing to do would be to actually just put in a dowel like this and that way you can make it go fairly deep into here and deep into here and not just two dowels but four dowels and also to make this part as wide as possible. On uh, this chair for instance this part isn't terribly wide, on these ones it is and that gives that joint here a lot of strength. Although one way to mitigate that is to have some bracing between the legs on the bottom and what that means is this joint here essentially helps out this joint here and also if you accidentally kick the leg of the chair you're not just stressing this joint here, again it sort of holds this together as a frame. But if you make these joints sturdy enough, you don't need to have that little thing in the bottom in the way. And it's a lot easier to build that way too. Now one thing I did different from my dad is I just doweled the armrests on there. Whereas my dad, he screwed the armrest in there from the side, so this part is screwed on here. And that little dowel, that hides a screw, there's metal in there. And I think the reason he did that is he put these on last uh, so he could work out exactly how high that needs to be on the chair and how far this goes to the front. Whereas I just relied on my CAD model. So long before I assembled it, I knew exactly where I needed to drill the holes for these dowels and for these dowels because I had the faith that the CAD model was correct and I just used my templates. Whereas my dad never used a computer, the closest he ever got to drawing plans is to draw it one-to-one -one on a piece of plywood. And inevitably that one-to-one -one drawing on a piece of plywood would get used for something else later on, so no plans or anything ever survived. And if you buy my plans, you get a PDF for printing out all of these templates, and these were all just printed on individual sheets of paper, and I glued them together. There's a seam there's a seam, and I printed these on cardstock, which uh, makes them fairly strong. Uh, cardstock just loads into a regular printer, so uh, this is some cardstock. And you can see here I can uh, pick up this utility knife just with uh, cardstock, although it is still fairly floppy. But I think most people are quite intimidated by the idea of building chairs. So uh, I put my plans on my website uh, three days ago, making them available for sale. But I only announced them on Instagram, and so far I've sold zero copies of it. Uh, oh well. I uh, certainly should have mentioned them at the end of the video, but I didn't because I wasn't sure if I am going to make plans at the time. But looking over the photos from my time-lapse camera in my workshop, I worked out that uh, it took me ten and a half hours for each of those chairs. Of course, that time could have been reduced by a fair bit per chair if I'd made a larger batch because so much of that time is setting up machines and also some experimenting and also filming it too. Um, but all the optimizations that I can think of involve basically the machining operations which based on my time lapse says that was 55% of the time was machining the parts and the rest of the time was assembling and sanding various bits and varnishing them. Which is where I'm thinking I can understand why people sell chair kits because if you make the parts on an industrial scale, 
basically the machining of the parts is the smaller part of the time and assembling it and just making sure everything's right and varnished that's a huge time consuming part but my favorite of those chairs i made is actually this one which i thought of as uh, more of a bonus chair because i started out by just cutting some of these uh back rungs on the bandsaw just to show that you don't necessarily have to bend them because that's a bit intimidating too and then I was like well since I already made the back rungs why don't I just cut up a 2x6 to make all the other parts and that way I could practice getting things right before I put these ones together and so that made this one a lot less stressful because I'm just using not very expensive wood so it's almost like something from nothing. And actually, the kids really like this chair. I think I might make more of these. Because the way it's made, it's actually more than strong enough. This design is a very sturdy design. I don't expect this one to break either, even though it's not made out of nice oak like this one. But anyways, just to make it clear, I have plans for these chairs available. Please, somebody buy my plans. I haven't sold a single copy yet, and I put so much time into making plans. It really is a lot of work getting all the dimension drawings and all the details and all that so that uh, hopefully everything is in there that you might need. And if you build your chairs like this, you won't end up having to fix them. Because uh, I've already made four videos about fixing chairs and Elaine, the uh, woodpecker guy, he's just recently put out a video about fixing four chairs because not well-made chairs, they break. So buy my plans and build some chairs, please!